truly i say to you there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom this is also mentioned in other passages in luke chapter nine and in mark chapter nine some people when quoting this fail to quote the passage as it reads instead they claim jesus said that some of his disciples wouldn't die until he returns or something similar but what we read is that they would not taste death until they see the kingdom of god or they see the son of man coming in his kingdom and this is what happened six days later when jesus or yeshua took three of his closest disciples peter james and john up to a mountain to witness what i think is one of the strangest and least understood events in the bible it is sometimes called the transfiguration one of the reasons that this event is not usually linked with the preceding verse that says there are some standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom is because the next verse which starts and after six days begins another chapter here it is important to realize that the chapter divisions are not necessarily inspired the chapter divisions used today were developed by Stephen Langton, an Archbishop of Canterbury. Langton put the modern chapter divisions into place around A.D. 1227. What is interesting is that in all three places this is told in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is a difference in the chapter divisions at this point. Most notable is the book of Mark. It is generally agreed that the book of Mark was written by Mark using the testimony of the Apostle Peter, who is one of the three people who witnessed the strange event. In that book, the chapter begins with, Truly I say unto you, there are some of those standing here, which implicitly links the transfiguration to that event. But in the book of Luke, there are no chapter divisions in sight on either side of the verse. So in all three cases, the chapter divisions are in vastly different places. One biblical commentator said it this way, the above verse is the closing one of Matthew 16, and it is exceedingly unfortunate that a chapter division has been made to immediately follow it, and thus obscure its real meaning to many readers. What follows in the next chapter is the fulfillment of Christ's promise to his, the disciples, as is clear from the opening statement, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. The and, connecting Matthew 17 and chapter 16, the after six days dating from the promise given the disciples and the some finding its fulfillment in peter james and john here then is the key to the significance of the transfiguration scene it was the disciples seeing the son of man coming in his kingdom it was a pattern and a sample of the glory in which our lord shall return to the mount of olives it was a visible representation a spectacular setting forth of each of the leading elements which shall be found in christ's millennial kingdom the author then goes on to quote particularize and detail these specific events so let us also look into the details to see if this event can be seen as a type of kingdom of god first i want to point out that these three men weren't the first humans to get a glimpse of the kingdom of god the Old Testament prophet Daniel also saw the coming of the kingdom of God. He says so expressly. Also take note that when Daniel saw this event, he makes some similar observations that other people will later make regarding the appearance of Christ in his kingdom. As I looked, thrones were placed, and one that was ancient of days took his seat. His raiment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the cloud of heaven there came out one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The Ancient of Days' hair in Daniel is described as pure wool, and his raiment as white. Interestingly, it's described this way also by the Apostle John when he got a glimpse in a vision of a man who identified himself as the resurrected Jesus Christ. It says in Revelation 1, verse 16, And his hairs were white like wool, and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice was the sound of many waters. 
and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp tongued sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Here we again find more clues. John also describes the face of Jesus as extremely bright in this state, but he also describes his eyes as flames of fire. Again we go back to Daniel. In Daniel he also spoke of the brightness of the face. In Daniel 10 verse 6, his body was like a barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like the color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. The disciples in the transfiguration were favored with a glimpse of Christ in his resurrection glory, and apparently he is extremely bright in this resurrected state. Just ask Saul, who was blinded by the effects of Christ's glory, as manifested to Saul of Tarshish on the Damascus road. And here are a few parallels in the transfiguration event that show that the disciples not only witnessed the Messiah as he truly is, but that they are also witnessing a very detailed description of the prophesied kingdom of God. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. From the fact that Moses, representative of the law, and Elijah, standing for prophets, were with Christ at this time, we may learn that the Old Testament saints shall have their part and place with Christ in his millennial kingdom. There is also another fact revealed here. When the Lord returns to the earth, he will be accompanied by two classes of saints, here represented by Moses and Elijah, namely those who have passed through death and those who have been changed. The three disciples, Peter, James, and John, may be regarded as representatives of the church. During the transfiguration, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are wearing white garments, the same kind that the redeemed will wear. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice came out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The mention of the bright cloud here is deeply significant, the more so as it was out of it that the voice of God was heard speaking. This was the cloud which had been withdrawn from Israel centuries before, but which now suddenly appeared again. This was the cloud in which Jehovah appeared of old, the cloud of the Shekinah glory. It was the cloud which filled the tabernacle, the cloud that covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tab tabernacle in Exodus 40. This was the cloud that guided Israel through their wilderness wanderings. This was the cloud in which Jehovah appeared in the Holy of Holies upon the mercy seat. This is the cloud which filled the temple of Solomon. Little wonder that the disciples fell on their faces and were sore afraid. The appearing of the Shekinah cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration was the intimation that it shall be visible to Israel again in the Millennial Kingdom. That it will be is further evident from a prophecy in Isaiah 4 verse 5. The sequel of the Transfiguration was equally wonderful in its typical signification in that the first thing that Jesus did after he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration was cast out the demon that his disciples could not cast out. And so also, in perfect typology, the first thing that he will do when he returns to earth is to cast out Satan and to secure him during the millennial Sabbath before destroying him completely. There is another interesting parallel, but to get to it we must first understand what appears to be a contradiction. Both Matthew and Mark recorded the period between Jesus saying that some standing here wouldn't taste death until the transfiguration event as six days, but Luke mentions that the delay was actually eight days. And we're reminded here of a quote from one of my favorite lecturers, Chuck Missler, who says, Thus we discover that every detail in the Bible is there by design. This insight opens an entirely new dimension of Bible study. Every time you find a, quote, mistake or, quote, contradiction in the Bible, rejoice. There is a discovery behind that ostensible discrepancy. Matthew and Mark, who are both Jews, recorded time differently than Luke, who was a Greek. Luke included the beginning of that day and the rest of the last day. This is also why Luke is the only one to use the approximation when telling of the length of the days. He says it took about eight days. But I also believe that the detail is there for a reason, and I think it is because it helps us recognize that the event may have taken place on a Sabbath, and if so, it would be yet another illustration of the millennial Sabbath and the kingdom of God. I'll conclude with this point. Peter himself refers to the event of the transfiguration as a sample of Jesus' coming. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we have made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Thanks for your time.
Chapter 9 Some people, when quoting this, fail to quote the passage as it reads. Instead they claim Jesus said that some of his disciples wouldn't die until he returns, or something similar. But what we read is that they would not taste death until they see the kingdom of God, or they see the Son of one of the reasons that this event is not usually linked with the preceding verse that says there are some standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom is because the next verse which starts and after six days begins another chapter here it is important to man coming in his kingdom and this is what happened six days later when jesus or yeshua took three of his closest disciples peter james and john up to a mountain to witness what I think is one of the strangest and least understood events in the Bible. It is sometimes called the Transfiguration. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is also mentioned in other passages in Luke chapter 9 and in Mark, realize that the chapter divisions are not necessarily inspired. The chapter divisions used today were developed by Stephen Langton, an Archbishop of Canterbury. Langton put the modern chapter divisions into place around A.D. 1227. What is interesting is that in all three places 